Good afternoon and thank you for including me in this video that will be compiled for a historical video for the Town of Orange's bicentennial celebration. There are very, very few people left who remember so many of the old timers and farms and how this town looked 50, 60 years ago. And so I'm flattered to be included in that uh, group. When I was young, this town still retained hundreds of acres of farmland. But what many people don't realize is a lot of the farmers had other jobs which, uh, or businesses or areas to market their wares in order to survive. The farm that I'm on, on Lambert Road, was owned by the Andrew and Ewan families since 1830. What people don't realize, our area was so rural, they produced product, but then they had to market their product. And there were still receipt books from when Wellington Andrew and even Helen Andrew Ewan they would market bottled milk and cream dairy products into the city of New Haven. Because who were you going to sell to in the town of Orange? Other farmers didn't need your product. The few residents other than that that didn't have their own cattle or livestock, they would be very few and far between. So the farmers here would have to look beyond to market their products. The Berry Farm on Russell Avenue was actually the Russell Farm, stayed in the family and is still in the family also on Russell Avenue. Chauncey Russell, long before my time, had a slaughterhouse on the farm on Russell Avenue and would produce meat cuts that he would sell in New Haven from a peddler wagon. You know, they had to be able to produce the product but then, if they couldn't market the product, they couldn't make a living. I mean, uh, this was what many of them had to do, and they would grow different crops, that they could sell grain. We had a couple uh, grist mills here in town, up along the Wepawag River and all, where farmers, yes, believe it in our shallow, sometimes rocky soils, they would produce barley and wheat and rye to be ground into flour. And a lot of times the miller would take a percentage of that ground, became flour at that point, and for his duty. Sometimes the people would pay and take it all back, or sometimes the miller would keep a percentage of it for his share. But then the miller would take that product and be able to market it so that he had income besides just grinding the product for a local farmer. Orange changed over time from when we were founded in 1822 and it goes back all the way to the 1630s when we were part of Milford. It was predominantly agriculture. A small amount of Native American uh, participation along some of our boundaries um, along the rivers mostly and down into Milford. But as the area developed, mostly those farmers were changing with time. And I think Orange saw the most change after World War II. World War II really became a transition period, both with what a lot of the farmers were producing, where they were able to market stuff, demand was increasing, but there were also a lot of people that were coming home from the wars and wanted places to live. While products changed that the farmers were producing, some of them saw as they aged that some of their properties could be marketed and uh, some housing started to develop. One of the largest ones of those was right on Orange Center Road and it extended from Lambert Road by the Post Road all the way over to 
about Miles Road off Old Tavern Road, and that was Fairley Farm. Fairley Farms was um, one of the largest around. I believe it was over 700 acres at its time. And uh, after Mr. Wilson H. Lee passed away, his son-in-law, John Demarest, and uh, his wife, who was Mr. Lee's daughter, Elizabeth, um, they started to develop some of that property. But what most people don't know is they were very generous. And we're all where the Orange Little League ball fields are today, the police station, the fire station and all, that was all part of the Fairley Farms properties. And um, that's how the town was able to acquire that. Uh, Mr. William Knight, who was our, one of our, our first fire chief and uh, superintendent of that farm came down from, I believe Vermont to be uh, part of that operation. He was involved in the splitting up of that farm after it was uh, past its prime. But Fairley Farms was one of the first farms to develop um, very special milk that was developed that was supposedly better for babies. And it was, a, a, it had a way it was processed that it was, um, didn't carry bacteria or possible spread of uh, other unwanteds for babies. It was the beginning of um, our seeing of pasteurized and homogenized uh, dairy products in this area. Um, where, just uh, examples, where Grassy Hill Country Club and where the Greenbriars are, that was all open land that was part of the, uh, part Woodruff Seed Company and part Clark Seed Companies. They were both very large operations that uh, were seed growers, producers, wholesalers, retailers here in New York and across the United States, they had stores um, that farmed hundreds and hundreds of acres on uh, that part of town over there. And people don't realize all that was farmed there. Um, along Ridge Road, there were only a couple farms. One was owned by Henry Clark. The house still stands. It's uh, right next to Sycamore Drive and across from Oak View. Um, Another one was the Novensteins farm. It was just further up Ridge Road, right by um, um, Hitching Post. And those two farms comprised a lot of that. If you went the other way down Ridge Road, you came to the Treat Farm that was a right, became the right farm after that. I think that was a King's Grant farm. Uh, the Treats had a extensive land holdings in that area in the Grassy Hill road area all the way to where Turkey Hill School is uh, today. So a few of these farms were massive farms that uh, over generations were fractured and different members of the families continued farming and some chose not to and sold their parts. As we moved into the mid-1950s, is when you really saw orange start to change. And then development hit a boom time. And you were seeing streets like Pine Tree Drive and uh, Carriage Drive, Nan Drive in the center of town go in. Um, you were seeing uh, roads split off of Meeting House Lane. Uh, land was being developed and all over town. And that ca carried really into the 70s. Um, with a lot of land being developed. And I think that's something that really distressed me. Uh, as a young person in town, when I got out of college, that we had rented land and gifted land and just use it land of, of almost 200, 290 acres. And I was watching land disappear all over town to bulldozers and I think that's what instilled in me uh, my strong feeling, feeling about preserving open space in the town of Orange. I think that a lot of the old timers instilled that in me about how important it was and the value of that open space, whether it's still used for agriculture or it just is for nature and for people to enjoy. But I have always felt that if I didn't step up and push to make a lot of these purchases, 
when the children of this town are my age, there will be nothing left for them to value and hang on to. And I continue to this minute with that belief and uh, I continue with it being part of the fabric and community of the town of Orange. And I find that extremely important. I mean, the stories, I mean, I, I touched on the Russell Sperry farm on Russell Avenue. Kurt Sperry, he could tell stories like nobody else, but he also made things work. He was the dog warden for the town of Orange for many, many years. Um, T.M. Wright took over the treat slash Wright family farm on Old Grassy Hill Road. And he tried for quite a few years growing crops and growing potatoes. And he figured out with the boom of uh, the influx of people coming to town that he was better off digging cellars and installing septic systems and stuff than trying to grow potatoes for nickel a hundred. I mean, farming is a tough business. There wasn't a lot of money in it then. There's still not a lot of money in it today. Um, agriculture in Orange is really handled by only about five families at this point in time. And uh, we all know each other well. We all try to help each other whenever possible because we are so limited, it's a very limited group. But it was that dedication and push of those few people that kept the character of this town alive and trained me for the last almost 18 years of being first selectman and six years before that as uh, on the board of selectmen to understand the town of Orange and understand the values of the town. I think you don't understand the town of Orange just because you decided to take up roots here. You actually have to get involved. You have to understand the people. You have to understand what's important and what the values are of the people and you have to try to make it work. I think I had many mentors, many wonderful people taught me <laughs> so many uh, skills of running the town of Orange. And you wouldn't believe it, but m I think most, most all of them had agricultural roots to this community. I think that without their guidance, I wouldn't be able to put this town in the position it's in today. Thriftiness, common sense, value, people's problems, solving those problems, all was taught to me by a small group of people. My parents, uh, Walter Hine, Walter Besputa, Kurt Sperry, Charlie Treat, Ray Buckles. Ray Buckles, there's a farm I forgot. That was a beautiful farm down on Indian River Road where Springbrook Common stands now. I didn't think much of his barn. I had to walk through there bent over all the time. It was kind of, kind of a low barn, but there is a perfect example. They made do over there. They were uh, German immigrants. They were kind of put out on the edge. There were two German farms over there, was the Buckles farm and the Foyer farm, and they were put out on the edge over there. Um, trying to think, of, of course, uh, Jim and Helen Ewan. I mean, I have to mention them. They gave me everything. So, and the list goes on. There's just so many people. I know that there's going to be people out there that say, well, he didn't mention me or he didn't mention me. Um, the, the list goes on. And if I forgot your name, I'm sorry, but, you know, there's uh, you so, so many. Oh, well, that goes up to, I mean, when I learned about greenhousing, I didn't learn it in school. I learned it from John and Gloria Capsulatro. I mean, they taught me a wealth of 
information. And Gloria, I still talk to her on a regular basis. She's a absolutely wonderful, wonderful person and advisor. And, uh, you know, I, I can't say enough about all of these people, but many people didn't know uh, that we had two in their day of the largest greenhouse operations right here in the town of Orange. Before Cheshire became the greenhouse capital of Connecticut, the Capsulatros glass greenhouses and poly greenhouses uh, growing crops up there, they were one of the largest geranium growers, uh, I believe in the state. And next door to them was uh, Cuz Acres, which was run by the Cuz Acreo family. Now, the interesting part of that is Mrs. Capsulatro Sr., John Capsulatro's mother, was Grace Cusacrio. She was the older sister to Ernest Cusacrio. And those farms were side by side. He was the largest ground cover producer on the East Coast. He shipped Pakistandra and ground cover from Canada all the way down into Virginia, as far as I know. Uh, there's ground cover planted in Washington, D.C., around some of the national monuments that came from Orange, Connecticut. And people are not even aware of that. Um, did you know that Southern Orange has vast quantities of green serpentine marble? And it travels all through, through the lower part of Orange, Connecticut into Milford. And if you get down by the Connecticut Post Mall, where Walmart now stands, used to be the Ryder Trailer Park, used to be the Milford Marble Quarry back in the 1800s. And when the White House was rebuilt, two mantles out of polished green serpentine marble came from the Connecticut Marble Quarry, which was part in Orange and part in Milford, and it's, it's still in the White House to this day. And many people don't know that. So we had a lot of laborers here that worked in the stone quarries. You know, um, it was, what time was that? 1800s. That was, that was in the uh, probably 1830s, 1840s, I think is when they started redoing the white, a lot of things in the White House. Um, yeah, no, so Orange's roots go deep. And uh, the character of Orange goes deep. And there was one farmer here in town, I won't say his name, but he had very long arms. And when I was a kid one day, I said to him, why are your arms so long? And he was in his 80s at that time. And he was standing there talking to me and he goes, what, what do you mean? And he starts scratching his kneecap without bending. I said, why are your arms so long? He says, because I had to start carrying the milk pails as my father milked the cows when I was like five years old. They would carry the milk pails and to dump it into the cans, which were then put in the spring water to cool it down. Well, from carrying milk pails twice a day, his arms, truly had stretched and he could stand there and his hands went have more than halfway down his thighs. And uh, you never think of these things. And some of these farmers, they had hands like a vice grip. They looked like a baseball mitt and they had a grip like a vice grip. You know, I mean, these, these guys and gals worked hard and they had to, had to produce. That was the only way they survived. You know, many people don't realize, you know, uh, currently, and I'm gonna touch on it, even though it might offend some, and others might be interested, but racism isn't a new thing. Racism has been around for actually thousands of years. They built the pyramids with slaves, remember? But in our area here, the whole Marsh Hill region of Orange, Southern Orange, Southeast Orange, is where most of the Italian 
farmers and the couple German farmers I spoke of were sold farms to be part of the agricultural community, but not quite in the center of town. They were market gardeners, there were chicken farmers, there were greenhouse people, there were some that expanded into other ventures. A lot of your farmers were school bus drivers, and a couple of those farms down there, two or three or four of them, had school buses at one time and provided transportation to the town of Orange children to get them to school. Some of them started so early, there were a couple that were horse-drawn school buses to begin with down there to get the children from the outlying areas to one of the four district schools that existed in the town. But that area down there had a very derogatory name in its day, and it was called Rag Pickers Hill. And that area now made them some of the wealthiest people in the town of Orange because the Zoning Commission zoned most of those lands commercial, industrial. The highway went through there, Interstate 95, and it swallowed up a lot of that land, and it made it so valuable that now you have locations like Restaurant Depot there, you have Tractor Supply there, you have the FedEx uh, truck shipping yard right there, you have two hotels up there, you have the entire executive plaza down there, you have Bigelow T's warehouse down there, you have DiCello Distributor there. And all of that was land that was owned by a group that, well, we, they're welcome, but we'll go over there. The west side of Orange, a lot of it was, there was some good land there, but a lot of it was shallow ground or stony ground, was where, amazingly, a lot of the Polish and Russian families ended up, all the way down into Milford. And that was the reason. They were all in like their own enclave over there. I knew a lot of those people. Wonderful, wonderful people. I think one of the most wonderful that came out of there was Walt Bespuda. But they worked hard. And that area was tough ground over there. But a lot of those families are still over there. Whether it's the Bespudas, the Bajinskis, the Lesniaks, the Lesniks, the Kamikowskis, the Filinowskis, the Astrabs, uh, they're all, a lot of their family roots are still all along that corridor. And people don't realize how they ended up in that area. So while I understand it's a sensitive subject with many, it's a reality and it has happened. And in some places, unfortunately, continues to happen, but not here in Orange. Um, I think we are one of the most welcoming, open communities in the region. And uh, I value every day that I'm here. And I think that if you drive around and you look at what's been done here, it's been done with planning and concern and thoughtfulness. And even people sometimes who think that they should get something a little bit more lax on the rules and regulations, nope, oh, these are the rules and everybody got to follow the same rules. And so I think that's why Orange is so important to me. And uh, I've seen our post road go from a busy shopping district. I saw it when there were still people living in houses on the Post Road. There was a time when there were a lot of residences interspersed on our Post Road. When there were truck yards all along our Post Road, there was Adley Trucking down by Bull Hill Lane. There was Yale Trucking by where Hitchcock Plaza is now. Uh, the Wilson H. Lee Printing Company stood right at the end of Orange Center Road, was a massive building where Home Depot is today. I think one of the oldest businesses in continuous operation on the Post Road is Orange Fence and Supply. I think they started there in 1930, and they're still there in business today. 
Uh, so we have deep roots even in our commercial corridor along the Post Road. And I think that speaks volumes about why the people want to be here. As we see the economy change with online shopping and uh, uh, different ease of access of shopping, some of those things have shifted from what they were. You don't need uh, canvas sewers like the Loomis's were that used to have a business there, a thriving business that sewed canvas for all the tractor trailers, truck tops, and all that sort of thing. But when Route 1 was the main thoroughfare between New York and Boston, trucks traveling through here needed that. I can show you postcards where they had signs where they used to sell block ice and chopped ice for the trucks that were carrying stuff. And when they got to here from New York, they had to reload with ice on cargo that needed to be refrigerated. And they would load up ice on top of their product and continue on their way. Um, people don't remember this. The police station used to be right on the post road. It was a little tiny building that was built where the current uh, post road firehouse is today. Um, you know, these are uh, gems of history that I remember from the past. And, uh, you know, you value where uh, Aggie Disbrow's farm was just after you crossed the post road onto Lambert Road. Lambert Road didn't always go straight. That was the uh, uh, Peterson Farm and the Disbrow and Foyer's Farm beyond that. And Aggie Disbrow's farm was right on the side on what is now Old Lambert Road. And there was a gray barn there in her houses. The silo ring stood for years out in front of the, where the barn was. And I used to mow the hay there for Aggie Disbrow. It's all condominiums there now. Uh, when they were putting in Courier and Argyle Drive, I remember they sold that land. They were starting a new house every three days. They were putting in a new foundation. We used to ride our bikes up through there. It was all fields owned by the Clark family, one of the branches of the Clark family. And um, every, every three days they were starting a new foundation there. They were knocking those houses out faster than you could ever believe. And everyone was selling. That was part of that demand back in the 70s. Um, this fairgrounds, many people don't realize, this fairgrounds and High Plains Community Center and the land under the power lines to the south of the community center. This was all Clark property. And the Clark sold a piece originally for High Plains School. And then with time, we ran a fair behind the town hall and Mary L. Tracy. And then Walt Besputa and a few decided we need a permanent grounds. And only Walter could deal with people like he did. And the town purchased the first 19 and a half acres right here that we sit on from uh, Catherine, Donnie, and Benny Clark. We paid 149,000 for 19 and a half acres that went from Orange Center Road through to Lambert Road, and we cleared five or six acres to start with a group of young volunteers. And that expanded and expanded and expanded to the fairgrounds, which is used by so many nowadays. And that was really the vision of Walt Pesputa and his nucleus of people. T.M. Wright was part of that. Uh, the Ewans were part of that. Um, oh, there were so many, again, so many. George Monk was involved with that. Uh, Jimmy Searles, the list just goes on and on, but it was a small group. And without that small group, ganging up a group of young people together, we cleared in one weekend six acres that made this possible. And then we've added on to it over time. We bought the Shin property to the north of it and expanded that where your north gate is. And there was another little more Clark property, which we purchased that adjoined it. Eventually, the town purchased the other Clark property under the power lines that goes, again, all the way through from Orange Center Road to Lambert Road. So we've really developed this as a central hub for events for the town of Orange. And if you think about that, that goes back to what I said earlier was all part of that vision that those old timers had for this community. And that vision 
created something beautiful. This building we're sitting in, this farm museum, I probably have, I don't know, more than 30%, I'll say safely, of the items in here. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I know there's a lot because I had a knack for finding things. As I said earlier, a lot of the local farmers, they liked me, they trusted me, they told me things or gave me things or gave me leads. And a lot of those items have ended up in this building. And um, you know, that it was so valuable to preserve that history. Many people don't realize when they come to the fair the blacksmith shop that's down at the far end of this building was a real building on a farm right here in the town of Orange. <laughs> Walpus Buda, rest his soul, was crazy sometimes. He got word that they were going to tear it down. It was a post and beam shed that was built on the Henry Clark farm and was their blacksmith working area. We got to have it. We got to have it. I want it for the museum. All right. Well, how are we going to do it? Well, first we had to empty it out of a lot of junk. Then he wanted the roof was the most important part. So he figured out a way and he got a hay wagon underneath that roof and they cut it and there was a whole group of us that lowered it carefully onto a wagon. The beams that support it are the beams that came from that building. Some are hand hewn in there. There might be some sawed ones in there, but that was his vision. That building, that remains of that building that is the demonstration blacksmith shop in this building has roots in Orange, Connecticut in the 1800s. People don't realize that when they see it, but that's how special this building is. It contains things that people, you just won't see in use anymore. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's exciting. You come in here and you hear people talking, well, what was that for? What was that? And he and Betty Gagel always loved sitting in here explaining to people, and Barry Novenstein, explaining to people what the different equipment was and what it did and how the majority of the community used equipment similar to what is on display in this building. And I think that's probably one of the most important things we can teach our children. There's children out there today that don't even know where their food truly comes from. Uh, when I was a kid, we would grow vegetables on our farm. Mr. Ewan would grow pumpkins, winter squash, different stuff. We had no trouble with deer. Deer were non-existent in Orange in the, uh, well, I can say starting in the early 70s, probably before that. But there were no deer here. And we would grow crops without any deer damage at all, or minimal. Once in a while, you get an occasional one through. Now, here it is, May of 2022. And I got called this morning asking, where are your cows? And I said, well, I hope they're in the field. Why? Well, we just had a bear on Royal Lane that we went to chase and it headed south towards your farm, not north as we were trying to do. I mean, so we've had an occasional bear in the last few years wander through, but there haven't been bear to speak of in Orange, Connecticut in a hundred years. Today, we had that mm -hmm. problem. I think that's so neat. People are posting all the time pictures is this a bobcat or a mountain lion or what? No, it doesn't have a tail. If you look at it, it's a beautiful bobcat. They eat mice and moles and voles and things like that. They may try to catch a cat or something, but they're far less harmful to your, to your pets than a fisher cat 
would be, which we have here in town also. There are other animals that have it orange, and I think that's part of the reason why that open space is so important. Whether it was the 376 acres of the Turkey Hill Preserve, the 46 acres of the Ewan Farm Preserve, uh, I think it's like 55 or 60 acres of the Wright Farm that's preserved. Uh, there's the Racebrook Tract is almost 500 acres between the town of Orange, the town of Woodbridge, and the Water Company. Racebrook Country Club, 287 acres. Um, the uh, Housatonic Overlook is, well, it's up to like 72 acres now because we've added land onto that. And all these pockets of land protect the character of Orange, but they also protect the wildlife that was here before us and will probably continue to be here, some of it after us. There's more to the wildlife in Orange than uh, just a few birds and some cottontails. Um, I have a pair of twin deer living in my yard right now. Uh, they're under, I know right where they'll be sleeping right now. They were just born and they'll be sleeping in a certain spot under bushes. If you see a little deer like that, leave it alone because it's sleeping, it's a newborn and the mother will come back. So these things are very important and people who've never lived in a more suburban, not quite rural, region need to understand that. And if you leave those wild animals alone, 99% of the time, they'll leave you alone. So I think I've said enough at this time about Orange and the history of Orange, I hope, and why I love Orange and value Orange so much. And I look forward to seeing all of you at the upcoming bicentennial celebrations. There are many, many events planned. And even beyond the bicentennial, Jim Zioli will still be in orange. So thank you very much.